Welcome, everyone. We have Jan, Luca, Jamie, Edward, Antrenig, and myself, Michael. And Luca is joining for the first time. Would you care to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Luca, uh, Pizza Mig, for uh, obvious reason. Uh, I'm part of FreeBSD. I'm a port maintainer since 2017, more or less. Um, I'm also the main maintainer of port that is uh, yet again another uh, uh, somehow jail framework uh, that still is not a jail framework per se. Uh, basically, the main goal of port was to uh, try to imitate uh, what in Linux is a container. There is no strict definition of it, so that's why it is somehow complicated, but obviously it's... Um, uh, container-alike framework uh, based on jail, so the FS, uh, RCTL, and PF for the forwarding of stuff. Um, yeah, as a heavy user of jail, that's why I thought it was uh, interesting to join. Uh, I had on my path some talks that I did on um, uh, FOSDEM and at EuroBSD on similar topics. The the usual thing is uh, uh, OCI containers and kind of like uh, use cases. Basically, what is missing in uh, jails to be uh, kind of like Docker in terms of user experience um, and things like that. Uh, do you have links to those talks? It was FOSDEM and perhaps EuroBSDCon? Yeah, I can. Yeah, drop them in the chat when you have a chance. I'll put them in the docs there. Oh, I see yep. one sprouted up. Thank you, Jan. Is that his? OK. Um, have you had a chance to follow the discussions to date on these calls, either through YouTube or the notes? Not really. I, I discovered by chance because uh, Grembo, that is another uh, it happened to me a lot with with pot uh, linked me through the uh, notes that happened some times ago on GitHub because the meetings notes are stored in GitHub. So that's why I discovered. Uh, but I didn't have the chance to go through all uh, the notes. Okay. I mean, the, the, the meeting notes are quite a lot. Uh, well, that, yeah, what was that? But as you are somewhat fresh to it, could you, off the top of your head, give your say top three wish list items for jail, based on your experience with Pod? So um, I can limit to two. One is to define finally the concept of a jail image. Um, so it's some sort of uh, cornerstone to get. Say to download a jail and run a jail. That kind of uh, concept is completely alien to uh, basically all framework, um, and that is, my opinion, uh, underestimated topic. Uh, but it. Do you makes picture that the, being a port framework component as a port maintainer? Uh, Did you just package install my favorite jail? Currently, port support this entirely because uh, we have a, a driver to run uh, JS orchestrated through Nomad. So we have, basically we made up our uh, concept of image that is just a data set. So nothing too uh, sophisticated, but uh, it's not OCI and all, all those kind of things. We don't have layers, we don't have those kind of things. There are something uh, in, in this direction, uh, but it's very artisanal, I would say, is nothing, uh, highly okay. sophisticated or followings any uh, any standard. But in general, uh, I know that Foundation would like to put something, or at least they wanted to do something in this direction. Uh, but let's say concept of having uh, image that can be easily moved or spawned or translated, that would be uh, something. Instead of creating locally images all the time, uh, or let's say Agile all the time, would be uh, fairly... Uh, Useful. Okay, continue. Fortunately, that uh, has come up and you're not alone. The second thing is um, jail. Um, 
how can we call it? Uh, I think a jail demon, uh, something that uh, supervised the um, life cycle of a jail. Uh, currently, everything is done directly through the jail command line, basically to run the pre-run script and the post-run, all those kind of script or operations are executed internally to, to, to the jail. Uh, and there are some conflicting features. Uh, for instance, if you have um, an ephemeral jail, you can have a non-persistent, basically, jail, uh, well, the, the post-stop or pre-stop operation will never be executed because it will just vanish on its own. While if you have a jail demon, uh, a jail can just basically disappear, can monitor for stuff and execute and clean up automatically. So uh, it will be, uh, in my opinion, uh, a natural evolution to have some sort of demon that take care of the life cycle of a jail uh, to perform operations. Okay, again, you're not alone, fortunately. Continue. <laughs> Is there a, uh, a third choice just to get this all started? Because we've definitely covered these topics and uh, that's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say for now, I don't have a third one. Those cool. two are already good. Uh, I have some news on that on that regard, by the way. I, I missed like the last two or three calls because I was I just made a prototype that is a jail demon that communicates over socket and uh, also manages the cleanup, which was our biggest problem. And to be clear, I know Jamie is here. Uh, I, I just stopped using the jail utility itself. So I'm wrapping the system calls into my program rather than the jail utility itself, which I didn't know that the jail utility was actually calling fork and then jail attached. That was new to me. I thought that we had a better way of handling this, but you know, uh -huh. legacy. Uh, so I wrote it in Oberon because it was <laughs> easier for me to write it in Oberon and Pascal style rather than C for now but I am going to rewrite that in two more languages, which is going to be Zig for myself and our company, and then also C, which hopefully then uh, Mecca can merge it into the jail utility. My C is awful. That's why I didn't go with C in the first place. Uh, but writing the wrappers was the easy part. It currently also uses LibUCL in a very bad way. As well as uh, as well as uh, LibExo, both are now uh, both now have wrappers in Oberon. If anyone wants to play around, although I don't think there's a market for that, uh, so it it parses with UCL and outputs with EXO out of the box always. Uh, the prototype, I think it's on GitHub. I'm not sure. I'll have to check, but the wrappers are for sure because I made sure that they were in there. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and my biggest and uh, um, the, the cur currently it only does one thing. It, it parses the name of a jail from UCL, a couple of commands, and it just runs it. And it's very stupid. Like it doesn't do anything smart. The, the Yon sends some very smartly designed UCL configurations that I'm using none of them for now. This was just for a con proof of concept. The main goal, however, for me was that if you say it to destroy a jail, uh, it and sometimes jails don't get destroyed because there is a resource there that is locked. This was also a problem on FreeBSD 14 due to a bug in ZFS, you would always have hanging dead jails, dying jails. So the main goal of my uh, demon was to make sure that as soon as the jail dies, it will handle all the unmounting and all that, the cleanup stuff, basically. That's what I was more focused on to see if it's doable or if there are any problems uh, and have a in-memory uh, DB that says what the configurations were in the first place. So like if you even modified the file uh, at and after the stop, it would stop. It was it would use the configuration at the time of the creation, not as the config files are at the moment. So it would it has a very basic thing like that. And yeah, that's why I was that's why I was busy for like three weeks. But uh, I, I think it's OK. And maybe hopefully by next week, I'll uh, put it on GitHub and we can start thinking of actually having that in base and hopefully in 14 because 
our current solution in our company has been redoing all of that from scratch and manage it on on a higher level like in you know elixir application which is not good uh, like i would rather have a jld handling that and uh, uh luca that, that that was your motive too right because we've always talked about the jld man this was the same problem that we get to which is in memory database of configuration and cleanup do you did you have any other problems with pot uh yes there is a third problem that is um uh, a specific use case that you have with containers. Uh, mm -hmm. So the major difference of how usually jail is used is to run some sort of uh, light virtual machine. So basically you have your demons, you have everything there, and in a jail, basically some sort of very small subsystem. Uh, while a container usually, usually is one, one process only, um, or at least, Process it can fork another process, but they're they're not really forking; it's just spawning. So you have a chain of processes, but they are all blocked basically by by the uh, and you only have one running. Um, in this setup, um, what we have when we run in Nomad, for instance, we have uh, the the running command is blocking the console and pushing the and printing the output directly out there. So we have the Nomad uh, driver that is digesting all the logs and putting basically reversing out there. Uh, and then um, for this reason, uh, we had a very complicated setup where uh, we put the jail command in background to run additional setup after oh. that. Because, because all the post start things, they don't happen because the start never finished. Because if, you're, because if you run the process, but the process doesn't fork in background, basically jail as a command never goes to background and it's not able to run any pot start uh stuff so that's, that's why that's because you're right now using the jail utility inside pot right yeah so pot is okay. it's just a, a um, bunch of shell scripts i see but even in shell you can do different things uh, if you're using persistent jails you can work around those limitations in shell we don't scripts. use we don't use persistent jails I mean, a container is by definition ephemeral, so that's why um, we we are in this kind of corner case where. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are forcing. While a nomad so, job is running, it has a UUID which you could use as jail ID, right? So uh, literally, you need a persistent jail across multiple commands, not across all of time, not a long-lived jail, but you would create your j uh, persistent jail attach resource limits to it and so on mm -hmm. and then you would uh, let the empty jail run to completion but it's a persistent one so it's still there and then you could uh, j attach to it from your pod nomad driver so that the jail just isn't garbage collected but the jail utility through a templated jail.conf or lots of command line arguments runs to completion, does its thing as intended, and all the hooks trigger, and then you have an empty jail, well, so hopefully an empty jail if you did it correctly, so no cron, no syslog, and so on. Then you put the job in there, let it run, and afterward, uh, you can use the jail command again to tear down the persistent jail. I think we have a similar solution. Still, we use not persistent. Uh, uh, that was uh, Michael Kremlin that this this mm -hmm. uh, they changed basically the behavior. Now, basically, we run uh, um, the jail start with a sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have a Jake exec to run um, the proper command. That so sounds we can... also wrong to hope that you always win race condition. <laughs> uh, now, now I don't recall it uh, how exactly that part works because I Unless trust Michael to you do use that. a sleep minus one and kill it or something. Yeah. It works more or less in this way. So basically, uh, the JXAC is going to take over. Uh, in that case, it's probably better to use a pipe, even if it's a named one. Uh, 
rather than I, asleep because you could have a spurious wake up. Okay, let's have that conversation. In yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Inside baseball. Um, that said, um, Edward and Jamie, any initial feedback on what Luca has laid out? Mm. We're all in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's really it. Uh, it. I'm not surprised. Can't use that word. It's redundant. But it's interesting. The surprise at uh, finding that yeah, user bin jail just does a fork and jail attach. Because yeah, there, there's no real magic there beyond what's already in the same system calls or and lib jail that uh, that you can use. So I yeah, I don't do. I don't do anything special and behind the scenes. It's a pretty straightforward program. I mean, it's practically a shell the way it keeps running background process, running processes and waiting for them before going on to the next. One of the things that I never understood is, and this came to me very late, um, I mean, the, the main jail players out there would be pot. Uh, there's Jailer, a Bastille, and CBSD. And from my understanding, everyone uses the jail utility. Have we ever had experience where someone wrote a jail command from scratch for their own need? So maybe we can ask them if they encountered something interesting there. Because I, I, I haven't seen anything like that yet, as far as I know. Well, are you the first one? Yes, you were, right? And what was it, McJail back in the day? No, no, no you did it. You, you're the one who's like doing the new front ends. Oh, the yeah. The Lua-based one, et cetera. So, uh, but certainly if anyone else has thought of other ones or seen them, do share. So one of the horrible old uh, tools which refused to die is Easy Jail, but it's also a shell wrapper around the uh, existing jail command. Exactly. Uh, which... As far as I know, was one of the first to make jail management easy, as the name states, and Correct. to make it um, affordable uh, from the storage overhead at the time, because it went very far with deduplicating the base system between jails uh, with Simlink magic and NullFS. Yep. But has did I see mention of Python rewrites? Like did I O cage at some point you may know more Python. about that. There was some kind of split fork takeover, whoever story you want to believe. Right. Uh some, but do we know if it's still just executing the jail command? I think yes. it's uh, partly uh, calling into uh, lip jail. At okay. least it tried to. Um, uh, last time I heard about it was at Chaos Communication Camp 2019 right. when okay. I stumbled into the offer. Quite literally. Okay, thank you, Jan. <laughs> and he that but he at least that it was on his roadmap but i don't think it has ever been finished okay it's this worth looking map. into i'll just say but 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 uh um io cage is by many accounts under managed such that let's keep looking forward uh then there's bastille bsd but also using uh jail correct jail 8 Okay. Yes, I, it's also sure. I stumbled upon um, to a project called Fubernetes. Oh, right. Uh, right. That basically, I think, was written in Rust. Uh, and they had a similar uh, goal, even if I don't think never reached a, a very usable state. Uh, but in their project, there, um, they were doing something similar. They wrote a kernel module. Um, to print or at least to advertise um, the jail status changes in DevD. Yeah. That and I think I made has... a module, and I think I made a port for that. So there should be a package 
available for that you can use it but I, now i i lost track of this i was basically to make this available uh, as something you can install uh, from ports uh, And then briefly, do you know if run J does anything different or it's following the same pattern? No, I mean, the, the model was just printing those. Say, and I guess that was some sort of uh, the component that they need to have some sort of JLD in user space to be advertised. Okay, what I need to do next kind of uh, to, to basically export the, uh, the life cycle of the JL uh, outside um, to be consumed then by their Kubernetes daemon that I I think uh, uh, everything is stopped for. Um, I've put years. a link to the uh, dev CTL jail kernel module into the chat, at Thank least you. to the uh, fresh ports page of it. And I think there's at least, there used to be one J, uh, jail runtime written in Go which if I remember correctly does the system calls directly. Oh, interesting. Even, okay. Even go through C, uh, go, but just we implemented the serialization, uh, which is normally done by uh, libjail. Do we know if that project is active? Uh, good question. Okay. Let's well, anyway, check. let's look forward. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, as far as I uh, know, RenJ. Um, has the ambition to be or like run C. Run C is the runtime environment OCI compliant for uh, Docker and Linux. So the run J was basically to mimic that. Uh, that's why it's written in Go to have basically a similar thing. Uh, it works more or less the same um, as run C. Uh, I think Amazon, there was a someone working in Amazon uh, working on that. Uh, but I think there was basically uh, no follow-up. Uh, how Go works, basically, you have to call the, the system calls directly. So it was not using jail, but it was trying to, uh, a similar thing that we did in post. So basically, try to use all the features that FreeBC was already providing to implement a container uh, alike based on jails. Um, oh, um so yeah, Jan is correct in the chat that there are some recent commits and implementation details. Run J uses both FreeBSD user land utilities for managing jails and jail related syscalls. And that's in the page. So yeah, go ahead and hit that link for more information. But I think in the big picture, we wanna provide better plumbing for everybody. Edward, any observations or uh, ideas based on the conversation to date? Mm, no, not really. I mean, sounds good from what I can tell. That's encouraging. Yeah, my, my, my other question is, um, and this is more of a, a political question compared to technological stuff, which is do and should we care about you know, OCI images and run C and run J in the sense like to be compatible with the Linux world. Because, I mean, I love the way that Bastille does the, um, the Bastille file, which is similar in concept to the Docker file, you know, but to have all of these layers just to be compatible with something that was created because they lacked so what we have. Quiet, is... Or is it just that I don't have my audio set up? Dan, I, we you hear you. <laughs> we hear you, that's for sure. And we welcome you. So let's see what I've got here. Dan, can One, you hear two, us? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, check. three, four. Check <laughs> one, check two. Okay, cool. Give him a moment to push some buttons. Um, the, 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 
it now is turning into a real conference. You know, the, the last exactly. bit what, that we need is just Michael's screen not working and it's a complete conference. You know? There you go. <laughs> well, let me push some more buttons. Here. Uh, no, no, sharing the embarrassing third screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. With with like you know SSH. Fortunately, I have a fresh reboot and I don't have hundreds of tabs open. Dan, oh, can you hear so us? So you closed your yes, passwords. Fantastic. Ha, of course, yeah, Jan. Uh, so, so so uh, let me so, recap so, 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 Dan so, briefly. Yeah, go. Uh, hold that thought, Antronig. Is that uh, Lucas joined us for the first time? He is with the Pot Project, and he gave his wish list. You can see at the top of the minutes there, which mirrors what we've been discussing from day one. So we're, we're following up on that where he's focusing on OSI inspired work and Antronik just raised a question, well, politically, do we truly want to be OSI compliant? I'd want to ask, do we have the file system infrastructure to do that with UnionFS, which definitely needs some smoke tests and go ahead Antronik. Hold on, uh, OSI or OCI? OCI, right? OCI. My mistake. Yeah, uh, OCI. I'm Good. not the uh, open soft, uh, yeah, software initiative or whatever. My my bad. OCI. Uh, so so yeah, the, the, I mean, my my, my, uh, my worry is um, okay. Let me put it this way: if if we had utilities that act as a shim layer, regardless of the uh, regardless of the uh, utility, so whether we're using, you know, Jailer, Bastille, GL utility, whatever it is, that sounds like a good project, you know? So like you, we vendors do whatever we want, but the shim layer acts on the system itself, uh, rather than we end up every one of us creating our own OCR compliant thingies, which is now we're doing way more work than we were supposed to in the first place. So th th that is my biggest concern in there from like the manpower perspective. I understand that, you know, Linux folks are going to come to our world and be like, what, you know, what do you mean? GL is, is its own thing. Cause the, th th yeah. And uh, I mean, the Illumos people did a very good job there where they have their own utilities that emulates Docker, you know, in a sense. Uh, without the need to, without the need to bring, without regardless of the way that you are managing your zones, although they do have a lot way better utilities than we do. Hi there, Muhammad. Long time no see. So th that was kind of my my yeah. my, my okay. point in there. And uh, uh, and to be clear, I am I, I haven't been using Linux for a long time, so I'm not even sure where OCI stands at this point. You know, uh, is it is it is it uh, safe to assume that? I mean, it is Linux specific, right? It it's not like they no. think about other. It's not. No, so I can jump in because I read uh, several things about OCI. Yeah. So basically, you have two specifications. So OCI is not a program or an application or a system call. Is two specifications about how should a little like like POSIX. So we have one a specification about what an image should look like, and then one about the runtime. Obviously, they started from Linux, so. Uh, um, so they were basically more Linux centric, but you have you can have containers on Windows, native containers on Windows. So they extended because Microsoft basically jumped in to get their own containers world in uh, uh, in Windows as well. So theoretically, it's not uh, Linux only. Um, I want to stress the fact that container is also not a technology per se is not really defined what a container is. Uh, in Linux as well, what Docker did, uh, they glue several um, technologies, Linux technologies like the firewall, the C groups and things like that uh, to make what a container is look like some sort of tool for developers. That is what containers is at the end. Um, and OCI provides some sort of standard way to interact with those things. Uh, if you are OCI compliant, then you can use everything that comes from OCI because for instance, you want to upload your uh, jail images, you can use Docker Hub or anything, those kind of registry that speak OCI uh, because 
it is what it is at the end it's a bunch of files uh it's nothing more um your, your shim is just you know the program that then understand and replicate things uh how compliant is pot at this time well, can zero. you describe like 10 20 percent 80 percent zero percent zero percent that's valid <laughs> that's valid. so i can see a good value in there from the sense that if we are building a oci utility a single one that can be used by all the gl utilities pot bastel jailer this could be a very good advantage where our uh, orchestration tools can download an OCI compliant image, put it in a directory, and there you go. Now you have a Linux binaries running there. And as far as I understand, the 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 spec also defines like you know this image should be running this command at this location. So you know that shim layer can also be like, hey, run the jail, then go run this binary with these following network setup configurations or whatever it is. And I think now we have a that would give all of us the ability to do that. And uh, uh, th this is another problem that I encountered. And I, just to be clear, I asked in the chat, but I didn't get a response. So uh, uh, is Edward the Edward from Bastille? Um, no, I'm afraid. No. Is the okay. Edward from Cherry and FreeBSD? Okay, so that sounds good. So the reason why I was asking is uh, we have now utilities written in C, uh, shell, a lot of shell, Python, apparently some people use, Go, and uh, I also wrote one in Elixir and Oberon. So if if we did actually write that shim layer, what would it look like? You know, like, is it a Python library? Is it a C uh, library that everyone else can tap into it with its utility? You know, that's also a problem that sounds very interesting to solve because uh, we don't want to rewrite that thing all over again. And I mean, the, obviously the one that makes the most sense is, you know, write it in C, write it once as a library, use the library to build the utility. Whoever writes the their utilities in shell, we can use the shell one. I heard that pot is now moving to Go, which means, you know, now Go can use that utilities lib C interface as well. So that also sounds like a good problem. But I do think that's a, you know, a conversation for a different day because that by itself is huge. And we only have RunJ, I guess, that parses and uses all of that. Yeah, RunJ basically, it's also the reason why it's written in Go, because you have a large amount of modules that are already supporting oh. uh, containers and OCI, they are written in Go, so you can just reuse them, oh. I would say, almost for free. So that's why... Uh, and then the, uh, what uh, Ranjay did was really to make, okay, this is Linux specific, so we need to make it. So you cannot use C groups. We have to emulate things with jails. And because C groups and jails are, you know, they are yeah. find out basically uh, what different uh, technology you need to use to make the same implementation of the OCR runtime. So the OCR runtime is just a yeah. file specification. Oh, you want to run this network in this way. You want to run this. And now we have to find what primitives from an operating system point of view uh, you should use uh, to make this happen. So, um, uh, are it was you in a position for, to for audit different. what that looks like, audit what's loosely there already and what's not? Sorry, I didn't uh, get you. Do you feel you could inventory or audit what we do have in FreeBSD that is more or less OCI ready and what's not, be it networking, uh, be it storage, be it others. And no worries, just just a, it's an open idea. Uh, there are quite a few things yeah, yeah. that need to be audited just to see where we stand, like the LibXO support and utilities, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. So there was um, someone working on that. Oh, detail. Um, great. I have to... I uh I changed laptop so I lost all my links. So but then <laughs> no it's, worries. Uh, no um worries. so basically the um, there are a bunch of OCI utility that are technically uh independent from from the operating system. Uh there was someone doing the port uh, of uh for instance the image expander, some just okay, you just download the image and then you expand. You extract it 
uh, and I think it was called Scopio, something like that there should be. I, I can make some research basically okay, where cool. we are yeah. at. Um, yeah, no, no, the thing no, is, no. for instance, for, for Docker that implements the OCI implementation, you can have ZFS as a backend. So you can have uh, the how the, the, the different layers can be extracted just using ZFS without using UnionFS. How you use that is basically you just um, extract the one layer, you create a snapshot, then you clone it and you start another layer. Snapshots, clone, layer, snapshots, clone, layer. And basically you can use this way without using UnionFS. Uh, it's a different implementation, uh, uh, but it's basically you can use ZFS natively to achieve the same. I don't know what is the performance, but that is basically, uh, if you check the, um, the Docker support for ZFS, it works basically in this way. Um, mm. And you can use, because open ZFS is both for Linux and FreeBSD, you can have it theoretically almost for free. Almost because you have to check that everything is <laughs> working as expected, but... Uh, um, so uh, Mohammed, you, you just posted uh, a link there. You think that might be it? I put it on the screen. Luca, could uh, you drop the uh, links to both specifications you mentioned? I need to find them. But yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, it's and, and, and my, my, my last political question, which is a sad one, is <laughs> should we create our own ecosystem? Like just like we have package and with package we have Poudrier. Should we have like, you know, we have jail, should we have our jlier that is the image repository of jails that anyone can run on their own prem and then some other tooling instead of relying on the OCI compliant image. I mean, sure, we can still have the shim, shim layer for that, but like, should, should we even, uh, what are like the pros and cons of building our own ecosystem, even something like Kubernetes, you know, a free BSD oriented Kubernetes. Because uh, there are some awesome technologies that is part of free BSD that other uh, Unixes can't use properly. One of them, for example, is being Dtrace. You know, you, we can like, you can have observability in, in, in part of these ecosystems. Another one would be, uh, our networking stack, we could have a way better networking. And th these are things that are not considered in, 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 in ecosystems that are born in Linux, you know? So that was the other philosophical slash political problem that I keep thinking about is tap into the existing ones or have our own ecosystems that then we try to find a way to market it to developers on, on why they should use. If I may, if OCI can support Windows, it sounds, dare I say, vague enough to allow for quite a lot of wiggle room. That's an uninformed statement until we have a bit of an inventory, but, but go ahead, Jan. The problem isn't supporting Windows, but the problem is how much manpower is required to maintain a platform. So well, really Antonix proposing if, our own ecosystem versus using the OCI loose definition but, such that I think it might be quite similar, but remains to be determined. Go ahead. So for example, uh, if there was a consensus that using ZFS uh, serialization streams as, as file system exchange format would be acceptable in the FreeBSD jail community, then you can ignore all the problems regarding uh, how do we serialize file system because you have only one file system with one canonical serialization format, which can already include metadata in the form of user properties. So you, have, you get rid of so many layers of complexity because now you don't have to deal with serialization and key value stores and so on. Um, that yes, there is a point where getting rid of all of these options is worth it. If Microsoft put a 10 developer full-time team uh, on the job of supporting this and they get it mostly done, this is not uh, within our reach. So 
just because it supports Windows, if you can pay for a seat at the table and people to keep it warm. <laughs> Nicely put, uh, yeah. That's not really the issue. That just means there are no uh, sufficiently committed Windows haters in key positions. which is good to know because that means uh, probably no more committed FreeBSD or other non-Linux haters, but that's all we know so far. Okay. So let's say- Go ahead, the, Luca. Just one thing, the specification contains uh, attributes basically that specify, that describe what is the content of an image, for instance. Uh, and then you have, okay, this, this is an image for this operating system, this version, and things like that. Um, the implementation, though, is outside the specification. So, uh, the, uh, for instance, using ZFS is not mandatory. The point is how you convert from an image, the system or layer, to the final outcome is up to you. So, there is no basically uh, a reason to use necessarily ZFS. ZFS is one way to make this efficiently. If you use ZFS, you can use UnionFS. For instance, on Linux, there are 10 different, uh, let's say, call them driver or modules, basically to, uh, to transform an OCA image to something that can be executed. Um, of course, the maintenance, uh, there is this thing. You, if you agree to uh, to a standard, then you can OF all the benefits of a standard. So you could use Docker Hub to store your uh, your artifacts because it's OCI compliant. So you just need something that transform a jail to those layers, and then you just upload them. Uh, the same goes to um, every orchestrator that supports OCI containers. You can use it for free because you are implementing the same uh, interface. If you do something on your own, well, you can do you can go wild, but then you cannot use anything outside that. So our experience is that we could use Nomad just writing a, a driver, and we just use still Nomad is designed to run uh, on Solaris, to run on Linux, to run everywhere. That is the benefit because they don't have uh, a specific operating system uh, lock-in, uh, but we, we just implemented that, that shim in between uh, and we got an orchestrator on, pot, uh, on top of it. Um, the question, yes, what is the burden between them? Uh, could be a little bit complicated, uh, for sure. Uh, it's... Uh, also, Docker, you know, is is a company that did it. So, oh right, uh, about that. Is there a, a commercial support behind Pot, or is it a personal project? Personal project. It's basically me, um, Grainbo, is also previously committer. He runs uh, a Nomad. Uh, cluster network um, using Pod and, and Nomad. So that's why he's into all different layers. And then there is uh, a couple of people that maintain some sort of registry. So uh, some sort of jail repository where you can uh, use their um, images uh, to run them on Nomad. So uh, if you look on the um, quarterly upgrade, there is uh, Stephanie is always keeping a section there with the latest updates and all the links related to, uh, mm -hmm. to the current status. Uh, Potluck, what? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Potluck is the name of the- Nice name. <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the things which such uh, alternative ecosystems enable, like for example, the once of the time at least prepackaged jails for um, readers, uh, are that you can get something like a ready to use Plex server within minutes or a next cloud. The downside is that once something is working, it quickly gets abandoned and you get a two years old Plex or next cloud or whatever within minutes and then get to figure out how to do the last two years of upgrades if you care about 
security and uh, feature parity. So, um, but the advantages that you can get uh, reconfigured software or configurations uh, into the hands of people instead of just uh, ported software. So things which would either be out of scope for the ports tree or at least uh, very hard to get in as a non-ports committer. Correct. And I'm hearing complaints that the plugins themselves are now pretty much out of date, such that if you want that aforementioned Plex server, you're pretty much going straight to a fresh generic jail and adding. Of uh, course. Yeah, which no, is not uh, what, where they want to be. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I'm, 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 I'm a yeah, this is a philosophic, this is a philosophical problem between what, you know, we call the gentle model versus the Debian model, where, in, you know, one of them you provide the binary, in another one you provide the way to have the binary. And mm. that this is very similar to the Docker Hub problem where Docker Hub actually has the images themselves and it just could be outdated. And the beauty of like using something like Bastille, which is it, there, there is no image repository, but there is a repository on how to build the images, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, based on experience, people have realized that the upstream should never provide packages unless that's literally their job. For example, FreeBSD providing the packages, you know? And uh, in, in that sense, it, it makes sense to have repositories of these uh, Bastille files, Docker files, yes. you know, something like that makes a lot more sense than thinking about the, uh, the, uh, an ecosystem. And then again, because this is our own ecosystem, we can provide JLier, <laughs> similar to Poudrier, where people would be able to generate their own images in their own infrastructure using these uh, j jail files, right? So it would make a lot more sense from an infrastructure this is, point. This is what exactly we have. I mean, Potluck is a collection yes. of recipes. And then it just provides the binaries as it is. I always was say, I mean, in my first day, I will never manage a registry just because it would be the first day we do it. Basically, you have a security issue and it, uh, it's a nightmare. So I want to do it. Stefan want to do that or say, okay, it's your responsibility, but it put basically everywhere. A, it's on all risk. So if you want to try stuff, then you can basically download it. But there is the, the thing is there are recipes and they are just based some sort of job that goes there, create the image, uh, basically it create a jail, install everything, and then it pack it. It's a tarball with the jail in, in, in it. So it's not nothing sophisticated. Um, for security reason, obviously you should manage your stuff. So that's why. Uh, you just need an HTTP point where you download the image. That is nothing sophisticated on purpose because uh, doing it correctly is very difficult. So you sh if you do it on you know on your own, easy, do it. If you do it for for someone else, it is a full time job uh, full of uh, danger. I an idea came to mind while you you two were both talking about that. Um, what if we don't provide the final user tool, but, provide, but instead provide the tools that others can create user tools with. What I'm thinking of is, for example, IOCage and EasyJail and Bastille are all third-party products based upon tools that the project provides. What if we provide the building blocks for these as yet unknown tools. Do you see what I'm getting at? Rather than we build the big thing, we build the little things. So we Things have, like we have, we, we have system, that. Sorry. I just want to say we have that. And I think technically it's called BSD install because BSD install can take a, any script and do anything with it. So that's what we do at our plate, by the way. We use BSD install to create our images because there is no GLE area yet. And that's what exactly we do. Uh, BSD install has this ability to parse a script and do whatever you want with it. In that script, there are uh, it's made of two parts. The first one are predefined variables that you tell it what to do uh, before and after the installation. And the second part is an actual script that it runs inside the true to the environment. And we use that as our building block for building our own things. 
th that might be what's like on top of my head that is like it's available as at the moment and this is more like a, if we write proper documentation that hey do you want to have the building blocks this is what the building block looks like you know having ccrc and uh, psd install and these very basic tools that actually do give us the ability to create a jail image, if, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question in a very weird way or not? I think it did. Perhaps I misunderstood what it was we were trying to solve because I've come in late. So <laughs> what would be the components worth splitting the thing up? So something like a file system, uh, from the point of view of the jail, uh, IP addressing, uh, DNS resolver, opening network ports to the upstream network. So what would be the modules? If you're asking me, I don't know. I'm asking uh, uh, the group. I, I did not get the question though. So, uh, I interpret it as split up the responsibilities of, go ahead, Jan. So a uh, uh, jail manager often offers a richer set than just starting a pre-configured jail you had to create manually. So it would take care of uh, LP address allocation, setting up your DNS resolver, uh, or exposing certain network ports, uh, collecting several file systems, things like that. Um, maybe we just bring your your host name to some service mesh, whatever. Uh, so, which components could be broken out of this and defined as this is the interface a jail image should uh, interact with uh, for the runtime to provide. So, basically, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that is actually a good one. Because, for example, in Jailer, all the things that you listed, Jailer does manage all of these. And while it's doing that, it exposes some variables to, um, sorry, it reads and exposes some variables that the user can use in order to uh, make, have things more modular, you know, to, to play okay. around with them, read them, put them in the specific places, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but because... the, the the sad part is it's it's like jailer specific, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, th th that's the sad part. However, here's the fun part, and this took me a while to realize. Uh, there are variables for some of these that you can use in BSD install, where BSD install handles all of these things for you, uh, such as the resolver, the IP address configuration. Uh, basically, everything that BSD install can do in the you know its TUI all of those can be converted into uh, environment variables and then parsed and used at the, at, the, at the installation process, at the BSD install GL process, where it reads the script and does the stuff with it, you know? So and much of that's basic system administration. It applies to a jail, it applies to a VM, it applies to the host. Yep. It, it's just um, a yes, unified ecosystem. Go ahead. But the differences with these kinds of images you expect them to be pre-configured so that you only have to apply it. Mm -hmm. oh. You don't want to go into the jail and then enter your current host network DNS resolver to each instance you've dynamically created. That's insane. That's the tooling breaking down and becoming worse than useless because now you are, have a half automated task which requires manual intervention at random intervals. <laughs> uh, if I may add, Please. that's not fully true. Actually, there is a trend, at least I'm talking about con containers that are managed and uh, ran by Docker. You can have environment environments so containers or uh, basically images are built specifically, you could uh, say parameterized, uh, maybe with some default values. For example, some password, uh, username, password for databases, et cetera, et cetera, if you run PostgreSQL or MySQL. And then the user can then define these values at runtime. Um, an example of uh, parameterization of uh, containers. Yes, but you... you uh, overwrite something or create yet a new image, etc. Of course, that's how you pass arguments to your container. 
but yeah. you don't expect uh, to customize it to each instance for example if you, you uh, if you want to change the port your web interface is running at you would use an environment variable but you wouldn't uh, expect to have every container know about a certain environment variable because there may be different providers of the IP address sync service or the uh, DNS or maybe someone uses a nutted IPv4 network, someone yeah. else has a routed core, someone You're else has an IPv6 yeah. network. You're quite correct uh, that uh, the point is here that it's up to the ones who's really building the container how much they want to make it par par parameterized and to what yes. level. You're, you're correct. Yes. And that's a problem I've seen a uh, pot deal with, where uh, if you have a very minimal container and you want to have it started in certain ways, they uh, generate a custom minimal startup script if you have a VNet enabled uh, hot jail because uh, it may not contain enough of the two uh, normal startup scripts or of a user land to run the normal startup script. So you will then see custom invocations of IF config in some file in slash temp or something. Uh, yes, um, basically we have two ways to, of start the jail. We can use RC scripts. Or mm -hmm. if you specify to not use RC script, basically we generate a small starter script that yeah. set up things internally. For P instance, in yeah, we call or, it or something. Yeah, tiny, the tiny RC basically uh, yeah. that uh, is built on the fly. It set up the the uh, local uh, if mm -hmm. config. Well, basically we we run some uh, some things there. Um, we build basically the startup script uh, on the fly. Um, we set up environment variables and things like that. Someone that you know. So you can configure the stuff, uh, but exactly to circumvent the fact that uh, BSD install in general uh, run with the assumption that you run some sort of light virtual machine. Uh, if you instead want to run only one application, we have the starter script that initializes what you really need, right? only that, and then you just um, start the application. Uh, yeah, you don't run um, other stuff you... in parallel. But you can configure the FreeBSD base system to leave no process running. Mm -hmm. So it's not needed. <laughs> if you have a full base system available, uh, unless you strip down your image so far that the base RC scripts can't run, then of course you need it. But you, if you just want to avoid running syslogd, cron, and devd, and so on, you can uh, just disable them and there will be no runtime processes left. Is the operative yeah, word opinionated? How opinionated do we want to be? Go ahead. Yes, in, in a lot of ways it is. OK. Go ahead, Luca. <laughs> yeah, in, in the run to, uh, let's say, imitate container, the, the point is the BSD base uh, is quite large. So if you uh, if you want to move the image, let's say, I want to have only, you know, Few things I want to run Nginx and only Nginx. I don't need everything else, right? So uh, the amount of the, the size of the image should be relatively small. Um, and that's Luca, uh, yeah. Have you heard of OCAM BSD? <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> so Michael, you know that guy who's writing stuff, uh, created an awesome tool where um, it's a it's a bunch of shell scripts that you say which parts of FreeBSD that you want. So the bare minimum is basically the bootloader. This it's a jail. You don't need the bootloader. The scheduler, the the way bare minimum stuff. The interface for are you using e, um, bridge ePair, VNet, or just inheriting? Uh, we support for different. Type of network configuration. Oh, okay, so we need VNet, so you know, uh, alias, or whatever. So you can put these drivers in there. You can add Michael. We learned very lately that there was another piece that we needed, which I don't remember what it was at the moment. So you just basically build a free BSD that has only these components in it, and TCP IP, uh, and you know. The that's jail it doesn't get much. its own network stack. 
from the kernel point of view, you're only getting your instance of what the host kernel provides. So this is true. You can't remove yes. uh, kernel features in the jail configuration just because the kernel potentially included as bloat in your jail image it doesn't mean that it gets executed on the host. It's which not a means, virtual machine. It's a OS level virtualization. Right. Which means the kernel is going to be as big as the host is, yes. but then you can have the user land be as yes. small as you need. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, and, and I mean, we've ended up with jail images that were, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I want to say like 80 megabytes. Uh, yes, often around 150, but yeah, you could pare it down pretty far. Yeah. And, so, uh, and we've before integrated after that compression. in our company. Uh, before compression, just the raw 100, between 80 and 150 megs. And we have integrated this in our environment, uh, in our operating system that is FreeBSD based. And we've had no problems with it whatsoever. That sounds interesting. Yeah. And because if, uh, if you take it far enough, you can have jails in this four to 10 megs of uh, file system size. If you remove everything but the runtime linker, the required shared libraries, and one executable. So I briefly supported an artisanal user land because there are a lot of things in FreeBSD, such as all the locales and things that you might not want and time zones and you name it. So uh, it can get cut down pretty far. And yes, a kiddo flew by. He's not feeling well. So I think he just got back from the doctor. Anyway, so I'm happy to have that conversation in parallel, uh, which actually is a great segue. Uh, I, I know at least one of you will be at BSD CAN. Who else might be there? And could we lobby for perhaps time at the FreeBSD De Developer Summit just to report on what has been uh, produced, such as the proofs of concept here? I'll be there. Jamie, you will. Excellent. Yeah. Jamie. Uh, Dan, I sincerely hope you will be there. I'm not sure. OK, I hear you. I hear you. It's, yeah, it's a burden. Um, Edward, Luca, can uh, do either of you plan to make it? OK, understood. Cool. Well, let's, as we approach that, um, uh, we can certainly be in touch with, say, I'm, I'm assuming John Baldwin and uh, Ed Mast would be managing the developer summit, but hey, feel free to lobby or let's coordinate on the saying, hey, we just want a few minutes to say what's going on because we keep hearing the same themes. We've, we've come to some pretty good agreement. We've come to some action, some actionable points here. And thank you, Luca, for reminding us of those just right off the bat down the list. It's like, yep, the first call was a lot like that. And thank you. Thank you. So oh, we don't have Dave advocating for his, well, a, a uh, state machine, but more or less what you've described and or Damon. Go ahead, Jan. So what I've noticed is that the same problem comes up every time. And that's not just the jail demon is probably but I think a call for something a bit more general, and that is state management, okay. runtime state management. The state isn't just, is there a jail, but which file systems have been mounted? What has changed? What's the target states? What's the current state? What's still missing? So basically, where are we? Where do we want to get? Uh, where do we want to be? And how do we get there? So you need some kind of, yeah, what Kubernetes calls it's, uh, what are, do they call it, the uh, reconvergence loop or something? Uh, 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 reconciliation. Yeah, uh, yeah, reconciliation loop. This declare the system target state and try to reach it. Right impotence, hopefully. Yes. And make it observable on the way there. Not with, in the D-trace sense, but in the sense that it's there's an API which does not revert to polling every second uh, to watch for changes, respond to them, wait, wait until 
the watchers had a reasonable time to perform their reaction and report success or time out. Mm -hmm. So basically, if I create a jail and I my network support demon will look at it, see, oh, there's a new jail. Uh, does it want network access? Okay, uh, here you've got network now. Report that my uh, blocking operation has succeeded. Yep. Or that I my my IPv4 pool is full. I can only provide IPv6. I report a failure uh, quickly, preferably, and then uh, something has subscribed to an event but timed out. So you get a timeout, and the whole thing starts sure. again. And the user gets an error, telling it, uh, "Well, this has failed at least once. I will keep trying in the background, but uh, better don't hold your breath." Correct. So these issues also exist on Beehive, where if you sit down at a system with a running VM, you have to read a lot of tea leaves of what its configuration is, what it's supposed to be doing, you name it. So uh, it's definitely a universal problem. But there are so many more states than just the existence of a jail and maybe the environment where we pass to some process in the jail, right. because you have the network interfaces, which... Uh, for example, the e pair to be given to the jail to attach it to the host network. Then the bridge, the other side, is supposed to be attached to, or maybe it's a routed network, and you have to uh, announce the host routes right, on the right, e pair right, right. interface to your um, OSPF network. So that uh, said, who's seen examples of this being correctly handled within FreeBSD and other subsystems or in other oh, operating oh, systems? Oh. Is there a golden standard we're following and want to aspire to, or is it just kind of a pain on every platform? It's a universal pain as far as I can tell. Fair enough. As far okay. as I can tell, Illumos is the only one who doesn't have any of these. From <laughs> <laughs> the promised land. Cool. The promised okay. land. So SMF to the rescue or what? I, I I guess so I, at this point. No, but seriously, I th I think I think we should start actually calling Illumos people into these calls. And yes. I've been talking, I've been talking with them. Their reaction is like, just use a smart OS. Why are you suffering? You know. Yeah, <laughs> SMF did despite uh, all of X, uh, uh, its XML uh, excesses, they did a lot of things right. It, 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 so. One of them is that they added the concept of a job to the kernel and so on, so that you can track the processes belonging to one service. They did it for uh, fault isolation. So if you had something like an uncorrectable memory uh, error in one uh, service, it would only take down the services afflicted by the, uh, the processes belonging to the same service. They would to isolate the fault, they would all get torn down and restarted. No way. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you can have an <laughs> uncorrect oh, memory error and the system will recover. Unless it's a part of a kernel memory, then, uh, well, um, you have to reboot yeah. the kernel. If wow. you have multiple logical domains, okay. okay. But um, okay. That's, that's maybe a lot more important if you inspiring. only have uh, parity on your caches mm. instead of ECC. Yeah, yes. But... Here's a question that uh, Lumos folks have told me that we don't have, which is, is there a way to do like top, but on the jail level, basically to see what amount of resource each jail is using? I never got to that point. I know that we can use RCTL to limit things, but can we like see them? Does does my, you my can make pass sense? a jail to top, but... Yeah, also with RCTL. Uh, basically, we really roughly, we do something like that. Basically, uh, with RCTL, you can see, he said the limit, but also see what is currently used. Um, oh, that's nice. Yes. That's nice. You can inspect so, per subject. Oh, okay. So not only not only uh, appending a rule, but you can also like see the, how, what, how, it, how it looks like at the moment. I see. I see. So then when you could do, for example, I want to say the subject could be a jail and the resource could be memory use. 
and it would do you have physical print. memory and virtual memory both of them i see um, I see a very valid point on creating something like JTOP, which is like top, but for jails, and it would you know print disk usage, I/O, memory, CPU, and stuff like that. Do we have a utility like that? I feel like we should. Um, Maybe we even do. I have no idea. Top for jail. Yeah, and this comes up with in storage where, okay, one of our 50 NFS clients is slamming the system. We don't know who they are. Let's find out who. But so that granularity is desired like across the board. So keep talking, keep talking. You have top minus J. So basically, uh, instead of creating a tool, you should make the tool jail aware. That should be um, the right approach. So basically, as long as all the resources are specifically attached to a jail, you can have, uh, in general, utilities with minus J support, basically. Um, so Then it depends if you have IOPS, for instance, and you want to know who, who's hammering, that could be complicated. Uh, same for network. Uh, uh, but as long as the resource is dedicated to um, to the J, like process, you know, things like that, top minus J, it just gives you the, the top view of the specific jail. Uh, the same goes with RCTL because RCTL is accounting for resource usage, uh, and because those oh. resource, if this resource is basically tagged to the jail, you can see it. Uh, the interesting one here is that top dash J, which I, I, mean, I was aware of this, I just never thought of using it in a situation like this. Uh, the interesting one is that um, the the global values at the top are all global, you know? So like, there is no, does that make those sense? Are, yes, and it makes sense that it's also so in the jail because those are global resources. Those are, you don't have a, a static memory allocation per jail or a static CPU allocation. You can fake it uh, for CPUs with different CPU mm -hmm. sets to partition mm -hmm. your uh, hardware CPU threads. Um, you, I don't think you can really do it for memory, mm -hmm. uh, unless you. I mean, it's 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 pretty okay to be honest. You know, you can see the processes, you can see the memory that they're using. And you can't you can't calculate them in the sense that you know at the top where it says memory active, inactive, wired. This is global. It's not mm -hmm. for jail. But I, I think I think what I we're think missing. We can. Go on. What we're missing is uh, an RCTL top variant huh. where you can cycle through the available subject types, uh, apply a filter to uh, add to or remove basically to the set and then uh, which one to monitor and then you get a sorted view of uh, these are the top consumers of these resources basically according by subject, if we can read this as pot does already. Uh, I didn't understand. Um, okay, so um, play around with pot, it can tell you how much uh, memory a jail consumes, for mm -hmm. example, uh, by counting its virtual and uh, present memory, yeah. if I remember correctly. I haven't used it in a while. And you would want to have something like this and the mechanism RCTL supports other subject types than just jail IDs like yep. logging classes yep. or yep. process IDs. Yep. And then it would be interesting to, especially interactively to filter and narrow down and widen oh. again your set of subject. Really, I want to oh. know if this and this, I want to see... Oh. A, Maybe by jail or by yep, process yep. or by, by user. Oh, yeah, that, that makes total or sense. Or logging and class. Uh, yeah, basically that. Lo yeah, logging class. I mean, is then, I mean, uh, the only reason why, as far as I know, people touch logging class is because of PostgreSQL. Like, I haven't seen literally um, any other use case. The reason there isn't really the kernel tracking of the logging class, but to apply different default uh, local settings. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that you get a, either the C locale by default or 
English American UTF-8 or something as default yep. locale. Yep. Um, what's really D specific is that the logging class, as far as I know, SU is the only tool and login doing this, uh, can set a super user their logging class uh, as a string bounded to, I think, 16 or so characters or maybe 31 or something, something small uh, to be tracked per process in the kernel and it's inherited and only the super user can change it. And because uh, almost nobody knows about it, nobody bothers to mess it up again. So it's a neat way to track this kind of resources. For example, if you have some service like HA proxy or your Nginx uh, serving static files and you want to limit its uh, file system IOPS or something. Okay, um, bit too deep on can do that. examples, but let's think observability whenever we're you know, looking yeah, forward. But That's the downside is that uh, one of the things you really don't want to use with uh, hierarchical resource limits is the percentage of uh, CPU because it's implemented by uh, having the thread just skip certain scheduler uh, ticks basically. Mm -hmm. So you add lots of jitter, uh, even if there's nothing to be gained. If this process ever hits its, uh, or if the subject ever hits its CPU allocation, suddenly everything becomes slow, stuttery, jittery, and annoying uh, without, so in that case, and given the core count of modern systems, you're probably okay. a lot better off uh, having some kind of helper to do, to create CPU sets. Understood. Partition okay. your logical cores. Okay, that said, I do have an open question. I heard complaints that RCTL just introduces a bunch of overhead. Does anyone have a ballpark figure on what that produces on a, on a simple system? Run your own set of micro benchmarks. Okay. I, I don't um, know. Uh, I haven't depends. seen any problems on our end. Hmm? I think it's below 5%, but probably it depends on the um, system that you use. Cool. Um, okay. Thank you. I remember. I'm gonna, in, go ahead, Luca. In FreeBSD 9, it wasn't enabled by default. Then it was been, at least it was been built. I think it's still not enabled by default. Um, we always uh, the, in, in the pod basically is oh you have to enable it and uh, I think you have to restart with it. Um, yeah, same with Jailer. We were like you have to enable and restart because it's still not by default. But I haven't seen any overhead. And oh, that's great. honestly, I I haven't note nothing noticeable. You know. Nice. Thank you. Uh, so for what is worth. Um, the reason why it's not enabled by default is that I also hadn't seen any overhead and I assume that my overhead measuring methods are just wrong. So it's not like it's disabled by default for an actual reason, like this benchmark shows it's 10% overhead. It's disabled by default, largely in just in case. Uh, the, pe the person to ask this question would be MJG. Mateusz Gozik, uh, the guy who's working on VFS scalability. He, I think he might have benchmarks or, or he might have suggestions for for benchmarks, because it essentially the problem there is that there is this racked mutex, I think, and it can get congested. And who is that um, person? What's the name or user? Name? Mateusz Guzik. Um, uh, JG, I think. MJG, you think? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Noted. Okay. I mean, 
that sounds like a good project to work on, you know, to do the, um, of calculate the overhead using D trace. The only thing that comes to my mind is I have some high load application running at the background that is in a jail, has a different user, has a different logging class. And what was the other subject? Logging class, user, pro process, yeah, process, jail, user, logging class, and calculate that with dtrace and see if there is any difference in you know entering and exiting a system calls on average and see if that there's any kind of a difference. I, I, it should be like a one day project to figure that out. I'll put someone on my team to work on that. This actually does sound interesting because we enabled by default and we haven't noticed anything. But then again, if you've always enabled it by default, it means that you actually don't know what <laughs> it was supposed to be in the first place. You see, like if everyone is a superhero, then no one is a superhero. So <laughs> thank you, the Incredibles. But yeah, that, 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 sounds, that sounds more like it, you know. Are there any jail specific DJ scripts out there that you've bumped into? Anyone? Uh, academic question. No, no, no. Okay. In the sense that, like, in part of a repository, Just, but FreeBSD yeah. does have its jail stuff exposed on DTrace, and we do use that, you know, to trace what a jail is doing. And more importantly, we have JID. You know, you can use the JID inside DTrace to filter by the jail. So mm. that is something that's very important to have. So what we could do to measure the impact of the mutex is uh, prove that uh, the mutex is only necessary for correct accounting, but not for uh, the safety of the accounting, basically. So in that case, you could uh, not take the log, uh, cor corrupt the performance count, but still do the accounting. You just compute garbage in the same time and measure if this uh, changes the runtime. And if it does, uh, try to uh, recursively break up the mutex into smaller data structures or use atomic counters. Or So I think this mutex also protects the the hierarchy of accounting. Okay, in that case, you can't uh, take any um, <laughs> liberties with it. Yeah, although that probably could also be replaced by something by something else, like I know epoch maybe. Uh... Or it could maybe get moved into a task queue or something or a background thread because how precise does accounting have to be uh, anyway if you run a bit over some uh, resource? Yeah, so originally the idea was to implement something with uh, you know Jeff Bonwick's magazines, essentially just keeping local caches of free items. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't do that because I couldn't uh, reproduce a, a use case where it would actually become measurable. So it was optimization that I assumed would be useful, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't measure the overhead that optimization would have mm -hmm. been supposed to, to solve. Okay. Hmm. How long have your test uh, rule lists been? Did you have tens, hundreds, tens of thousands of uh, rules to the match uh, against? Hundreds, I think. Okay. So uh, allocated from the same UMA zones so are probably fitting into the same L1 data cache? Probably. Mm. OK. It was really supposed to be used with handwritten rule sets and not automatically generated rule sets. Yeah, but with jails and imaging, you could yeah. get it to the range where a big system these days can have like hundreds of CPU threads. And if you put a few hundred jails on a single box, that's no longer unusual. Uh, yeah. It was designed 
for uh, like previous era of uh, of servers where you had users in a single system image. So how good is Docker observability? Do we, through Dtrace and such, have advantages over it? Or is that Brendan uh, Gregg working on BPF trace? No, that... <laughs> Where's I mean, the promised first, land? First of, first of all, there is no Dtrace on Linux. It Correct. Is, you know, legal yeah. stuff. Right. And yep. then the, 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 on the other end, you have um, uh, the Linux tracing facilities, which are good. Let me, like, they yeah. are really good. The problem is that because things are very much scattered around, so you have, you know, the namespaces and the C group and stuff like that, you have, when your your filtration techniques should be very unique, like you can say, filter the Docker container named dub, 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 but then you have to figure out which C group is that, which number of namespaces that, get all of that together, script them all with each other, and yep. now you get proper, yeah. But it's doable. It's not like people are, are doing that very well, especially with eBPF being there. Now you can script inside the kernel without ever leaving the user land and figure out what's happening in there. So it's, it's but uh, again, this it's not as good as running zones with Dtrace. You know, like it's it's not the that's the promised land, not that, what okay. Linux is. Yeah, so uh, I've I have been playing around with SmartOS after talking with the folks, and that have you? Is, okay. Yeah, it, it's it's way more advanced in the sense of the Dtrace and the zones, and overall the Dtrace plus the operating system integration overall is very good. Yep. I just learned that their debugger is also available on FreeBSD, but I don't know how MDB? good it is. MDB, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, luckily, Dtrace also plays nice with the host utilities on FreeBSD in the sense that you can say when this happens in the kernel panic, so now I have a shell uh, that I can debug the kernel itself in, in Kdump or whatever it is, you know, so that's very good as well as the other one that I liked that I was just playing with like a couple of seconds ago, which was uh, when a process does this, stop it. So the process stops, you can, you can get a core dump of that, which is a lot more efficient than running an application inside uh, LLDB or MDB or whatever. It's, it's way more efficient. So uh, yeah, that's, that, that has been very nice. Uh, okay. But yeah, zones and Dtrace is is way more advanced than than what we have. So we really should have mm. just imported that back when we brought in Dtrace and ZFS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, uh, 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 one more thing that I'd like to sure <laughs> more philosophical <laughs> apologies. Questions. Oh no no yeah. no, a technical one actually. Yes, okay, cool. No, so, I love them. So so one of the interesting ones is that we have a TCP, UDP, and all of these network protocol providers on Dtrace on FreeBSD. So you can say, you know, show me all of these TCP stuff. And it has very good defined arguments. So you can get, you know, the source IP, destination IP, uh, what kind of a TCP it is, you know, is it in, out, etc. So it's very good. But uh, as far as I can tell, it is not jail aware or, you know, VNet aware. It just talks with the TCP stack on the kernel. And that is something that should be added. And I have no experience on that, but I don't know where it should be added or how it should be added. But that sounds like a very good idea where you can say, hey, show me the TCP stuff, but where the VNet mm. equals two. So now I'm seeing everything in a specific VNet, you know? Yes. That, that sounds very interesting. Mm. Uh, Jan, do you have an experience in that? Do we have it that I'm not aware of? Because I was uh, looking for it a lot. Uh, the socket structure has to know which VNet it belongs to. Uh, so there has to be a pointer to the right structure somewhere to walk, but... I haven't tried doing that. Did but Dietrich you're right, it should be definitely be added uh, as a way to filter basically in Dtrace by jail for VNets. At least by jail ID, jail name would be nice as well. I have this weird sense that Dtrace plateaued on FreeBSD and it's just not kind of continuing its trajectory. 
it's it's so sure. useful <laughs> and who like who's active with it who's producing new shared uh, the, um, the d watch command and so on yep that's a pinnacle it's, <laughs> it's been mostly devon doing a lot of work but one of the ideas is and again the lumos guys are doing this very well is like let's say you're deploying a new driver or a new subsystem their design guideline quote unquote is like mm -hmm. they have to have D-Trace probes. You can't okay. add a new thing without having D-Trace probes, like, uh, you know? Hmm. So, and we, nice. we don't have, like, right now we have the um, the latest features was Netlink. And luckily, Netlink does have D-Trace probes. And I was very happy about that. But yep. I, I think uh, there are a lot of subsystems in FreeBSD that don't have the appropriate probes. And especially user land uh, application aware for the head has been some work in the past, for example, to add it to Postgres and to have something like begin query planning and query planning and so on, so that you could see with D trace watch how long a certain steps in the query processing talk and so on. But I don't know if it's still working, if it's just disabled by default. And the other thing is that uh, all of these trace points are disabled by default, and which is fine, and only available to the super user, which isn't fine, in my opinion, because mm. that way you can't use it as in, in, in a lot of ways. I think of it as a form of structured logging you can enable on demand. So if I shared my screen right now, I have only one terminal open and all I've been doing for the last three days is detracing Postgres. Oh, interesting. And the reason for that is we have a disabled by default in our ports. I have no idea why, like it's there. Why aren't we enabling it by default? And uh, because I can't compile ports on every customer every time, I'm, I'm stuck with using the PID provider, which is mm. I'm tapping into the user land, which is a nightmare what, of mine. What you uh, could do is try to get a hold of the port maintainer and ask them to add a flavor enable to it? the port. <laughs> oh, that too, but flavors. adding a flavor to the port is the less invasive way. That way the build cluster gets to build it twice, but um, because of how flavors are implemented, but at least uh, you can have more than one package produced. I've done the same for my S6 RC uh, port, where there's the default flavor, which plays nice and respects the FreeBSD file system hierarchy, but the uh, other flavor uh, expects a tempfs in the slash, uh, slash one path uh, because it wants to be able to support systems where slash var um, run isn't available at this state in the boot process. And then I need it okay. that way. And rather than having to build it every time and again, I got it in as maintainer as a second flavor and it's a tiny port. So nobody complained about build times. Uh, you can run into some port committer complaining about the added load on the poor, poor uh, bit, hey, uh, cluster off topic, machines. Off topic, off topic. <laughs> so that said, we're approaching an hour and 45 minutes. Do we have actionable to-do items mm. for ourselves over the coming week? It sounds like, Anshnig, you're pretty darn busy. I hope to do yes, some sir. of that auditing of LibXO and UCL because the wiki is way out of date. Yes, sir. Uh, so, so my goal is still the same. I is um, I have an Oberon program, and uh, again, I'm sorry for the C lover and Pascal haters, but come on, man, yeah. writing Pascal syntax is a million times easier than C is like Arabic, by the way. Did you do you know that that C is everything is in reverse? You know, oh, like you you put the you only put the type. <laughs> you know, like you put the type, then the variable, like every other thing in the plant is like, you know, variable, then you say that it's like very That's line, because man. every type is also an expression C of a C type. is like what? Arabic? Arabic? <laughs> yeah, you know, because like in Arabic, you write, you, you write from, you know, from the, from the right to the left. And C is like, it's, it's in reverse. 
And yeah, what Jan said is correct because, you know, you, you, every type is also an expression. That's why they built it that way. Not that they had any... No, Arabic they didn't influence. build it that way. It grew that way and then it, it grew became conscience. Uh, because yeah. basically, suddenly it was a rake and they couldn't put it down and they couldn't agree to add one more uh, <laughs> keyword to the language because <laughs> static was already overloaded in that context. <laughs> so... It, so, so so yeah, I'm I'm just loving writing in a Pascalian language, honestly. Anyway, so my I my goal is by next week I should also put on GitHub my prototype, which is using libxo, li using libucl, using libjl or glparam, technically speaking, in order to do the very basic minimal stuff in a very stupid way. And I think someone should audit that and see if there are any things that we can learn, and then then we can cleanly move it to C and into having a GLD. The only thing that it does now very well is an in-memory database, and that's pretty much it. So uh, that's cool. my goal for now. But after having this conversation, I think I'll also work on um, uh, let's let's call it RTOP, not the JTOP, RTOP, where it uses <laughs> uh, RCTL for 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 doing the top-like thing. Uh, that sounds like a very nice project. Um, I have no actionable things right now, but no, after plenty, we, honey, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, do we have a point I, person for unprivileged jail to totally interrupt you? Like Jamie, I know it's technically on your plate, but is Mecca looking at that or remind me who is, uh, archi architecting that. <laughs> And I'm fine with a rhetorical question. Because <laughs> that kept, uh, Antonik, that came up quite a bit in the last two calls. It's just the whole notion of an unprivileged jail. What, you know, should you be jailing every Firefox tab? You know, what, what are the use cases? So that was pretty fascinating. I hope you've given that a listen. So do we have an agreement uh, about the intended semantics of, of that, just I to make sure so. that what we're, we're trying to do is secure. No, no, the thing we want is a jail which is only secure in so far as that you can't escape it without loading a kernel module uh, for accounting purposes only. So to track processes, for example, or to apply resource limits to them. Uh -huh. And if you want a secure or the unprivileged uh, jail. Okay, continue. And the problem is that there are only a few subject types and the PID isn't useful because the process uh, is expected to fork if it's a non-trivial service. You don't want to allocate a globally unique user IDs to your jails because you maybe want to have the same user ID into different jails. <laughs> Uh, have different uh, resource limits, so they have to be different subjects. Uh, the same applies to the uh, logging class, which could be abused uh, to embed this information, but it's not intended to be used that way. And there's no tool in base to apply it from the command line. You would have to write your own uh, C code to call a set uh, logging class a super user. So that only leaves the jail ID as the subject you can apply resource limits to. Yeah. And uh, in but, a but lot like, of ways, but... jails do the hard part, which is tr recursively tracking a set of processes. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think you can use SU to set login class manually. Yes, if you have the login class defined in login conf. You can't set it to an arbitrary string, I think. Only if this hmm. user has in the master.parsity a compiled version of this database defined this login class will as you look it up and apply it. So you um, have um, to write it all out to files, mm -hmm. which is not suitable for interactive or dynamic use. You would so have like to... a bug. Mm, I'm so sorry. No, 
it's not really yeah. a bug. It's not intended to be used that way. It uh, gets just... applied when it's configured in the user database. So, but... so just like it's... I'm so young that I discovered secure. What was it, what was the name? Secure level a couple of weeks yeah. ago. I'm that young. Yes. Uh, why does logging class exist in the first place? I want to understand that. Why it's tracked by the kernel? No, no. Oh. Why does it exist? You know, the concept why, of like... logging class. Yes. Uh, let's say you have uh, English speaking and French speaking users. And they want to have a different locale depending on who logs in. Uh, so you have to set the locale depending on the user and you put the user in a, and because you don't want to have to configure all of this per user again and again and again, you define it once in a logging class and then apply the logging class to a, to certain users. So it's a or, grouping mechanism, or or or, or 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 change the logging class of the default, you know, which is okay. I see. Yeah, because 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 I do have to do that. So yeah, because I do have to do that if I want to see Armenian letters in a free exactly. BSD terminal. Because uh, it's Unicode. Okay. You would um, go over those users who want this uh, language, for example, and set their local accordingly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These days, uh, with uh, Unicode support and UTF-8, it's no longer that you have to pick which language you can even view. <laughs> but it used to be with 8-bit encoding that if you uh, wanted to be able to view uh, French, you couldn't read... Uh, yeah, for example, you couldn't read uh, Russian or something. You had mm. to pick one at a time. Uh, with U uh, UTF-8, you can at least view all of the encodings. So, 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 uh, uh, in, 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 uh, here's an interesting question: Why the default is not UTF-8 at the moment? Um, because there are still systems with uh, paths encoded in such a way that they do not decode to valid UTF-8. Uh, glyphs or code points. So UTF-8 is a rather clever encoding. It's a prefix free code where you have the first, if the first bit is zero, it's a seven bit encoding. So if uh -huh. the first, and then the other, the top bits decode if it's the first and only the first of two and so on, um, bytes containing this code point. The problem is that there are valid, for example, Latin one or nine um, text files, which do not decode to co UTF-8 code points. So I see. you would badly break existing file systems if you try to reinterpret them, because suddenly those aren't strings, essentially. It's no longer text. It's I not see. garbage text. It's undecodable. At the, you can't assign yeah. a code point to this hmm. i see it's I see. like I a parity error and, i mean to, to be honest i my my default configuration on my free bsd machines is always utf8 of course you know armenian but i i've never had anything break before but if you had an old uh file system uh, uh -huh. with uh where you use some 8-bit encoding some windows yeah. code page for yeah. your file names and now you yeah. try to do an ls on it without yeah. some kind of file system capable of transcoding this yeah. beforehand yeah it, so it, it, if you it, just it actually brings the hex took, values <laughs> uh, zfs or a ufs file system and said you're utf-8 exclusive now and suddenly the system is uh, broken and you have file names you can't even delete rather because yeah hmm. okay. interesting it's, uh, Makes sense. it's really uh, that does bring me to, to another question, which is, which is, can we have the jail names in non ASCII? Have you tried? Uh, I have not, because I thought that we can't. I, I haven't, I haven't, because I mean, I run a lot of jails that are Armenian specific, you know, like an Armenian Tried. WordPress. Yeah. Wait, wait, are, it would have problems. <laughs> yeah, um, have problems. Standing by. In me, go specific, ahead. I know that I. Just make the simple check of looking for a dot as an illegal character, 
And, you know, you have things outside of ASCII, you know, it could be part of something else. I don't know. I guess because, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, so, UTF-8 always has the high bit set for uh, part of anything else. Because it is it is just, you know, it is treated as a binary string, except for it does look for that dot. So as long as you don't have a problem with that, perhaps so. And May, okay, I'll, I'll the try that. between jail name and jail today. host name. Yeah. No, at I, least at the I, kernel I level. I don't know about the program offhand. Yeah. I mean, I wrote it. I should uh, know about it, but I don't. <laughs> and interesting, because like I have the host name set to, you know, IDN stuff, like the international domain name level, stupid, non parsable oh. by I. It's just awful. And I would love if everything could just be like in Armenian or like anything non uh, ASCII, you know, that that would be very interesting. I, I don't see any reason why not. Because, I mean, you know, Jamie, the dot is for the hierarchy stuff, right? That's pretty much it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that does sound like a very valid thing to do. And I mean, our, you know, a lot, I, for like non English communities in like Japan and Canada, because, you know, French, it would be very beneficial, I guess, to have something like that. That could be our market entry. You know, <laughs> you can have containers in Armenian your containers. own language. Yeah, you know that's <laughs> yeah okay. That that that, that I, I'll try. I'll try that for for sure. For yeah, sure. try that. If your connection drops, we'll know. <laughs> it's a on problem. production. On yeah, on production, of course. <laughs> so yeah. That, okay, that we're at nearly two hours. Any other thoughts, ideas, uh, observations, uh, philosophical questions? Yes, Jan. I duck up my old. Um, execute uh, via Unix socket prototype code. Do you have a link? Uh, no, it's okay. not at that stage. So um, the idea is to represent a service to be started as a file descriptor for the process if it's ever running, a file descriptor for the executable, one for the working directory and sealed memory file descriptors for the arguments and environment. So that you would basically not have to do any name related operations to start the service because it, you would do it with f exec uh, ve. Uh, so, uh, and all of the file descriptors are already there. Hmm. In theory, okay, these days uh, we have the path only file descriptors, which haven't performed the permission checks yet, which is also interesting. And the other things I wanted to support is basically a, a state, uh, which can be updated, a named state, uh, and event counters, basically named events with a counter value, and you can just not notice if it's... Would that be helpful for jail? Yes, it would be very helpful. Okay, we'll poke at it. Uh, Anthony Be needs to drop. It sounds like a few of us need to drop. Yeah. Any final Thank thoughts? Very much. Questions? Go ahead. Yep. Cheers. Uh, and Jan had said, hey, he hasn't received feedback on his UCL uh, idea for some uh, templatable usage. I've got the link in the notes there for what it's worth. I can throw it in the chat if someone's wanting to look at the UCL library um, code. Exciting. But it could be worked around for jails as the only variable we care about is the jail name by, okay. by just creating a new parser and combining the results or something for each jail. Okay. So we can solve our special case just fine, but it would be nice to have a generic solution in libus here. Fair enough. We look forward this to this is more an aesthetic there. question then. So Damie, Jan, Dan, Edward, anything else for this meeting? Well, we've lost some people. I'd like to call it and yeah. thank you all. Go ahead. I heard a voice. Well, I'd like to call the official meeting at 11.54 Pacific, and I wish you a great week. See some of you tomorrow on the Beehive call, and I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes. Take care, everyone. Okay.